I don't know about you, but I don't know where I'd be without my Jesus. Amen. amen, amen, and amen. Well, I probably do know where I'd be, but it wouldn't be a good place. So praise God for, thank, praise God for Jesus and hallelujah for sending his son. Well, hey, we are rolling along in our series entitled Breakthrough in 2022. And um, I want to encourage you not to allow this series, and I've said this before, but not every week, but not just to be a slogan, but it's like, God, what do I, what do you want for me? Where, where, what do you want? Where, where, where do I need to break through in my life? Is there, is there things that I need to break through in? And is there things you want to get me to another level in, in my life? And I don't want to stay stale. I don't want to stay stagnant because we know what happens when we're stale and stagnant, don't we? We get like a green pond, don't we? It just gets kind of, ew. But when there's water flowing and when it's moving, it's just beautiful, isn't it? It just, it just keeps giving life, doesn't it? So let's all continue to be praying for breakthroughs personally, corporately, as a church, and as a nation. Amen? And that's where we've been the last since July 3rd. Is that we've been in a nation, and God just keeps putting words. The other day, he put another word on me. It's like, okay, here goes another ser- or another message in this. So I don't know. I mean, at, at the end, of, I think at the end of 22, it's got to end, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But anyway, God knows, and we'll just leave it in God's hands. And so if, you'll, uh, st- if, you, if you can, and will you stand and turn to Romans chapter 13? We'll get there in a moment. <clears throat> and um, last week, the message was centered around accountability, and I broke it down into three main parts, and uh, that we are accountable to God for our actions, aren't we? The first couple that God created, Adam and Eve, right, found that out the hard way and uh, they diso- as they disobeyed God. And in the one and only area that God gave, the only thing he told them not to do, uh, and, that, and, they, and they did that very thing, didn't they, Right? They disobeyed the Lord, and then instead of being accountable for their actions, what did they do? They played the blame game. Now, I know nobody here has ever played the blame game, right? Good, good, good. That's only me. I was the only one. I had, four, I had two brothers, two sisters. Trust me, I played the blame game. I, it was great. I could blame it on Michelle, Marie, John, Kevin, you know, all of the, all those folks, you know. And, uh, we, but we, didn't, we know that it didn't work out. Probably at your house it didn't work out, and it surely didn't work out in the Bible, did it? with Adam and Eve, right? Uh, Not only did their sin affect them, but it affected all mankind. We're still still reeling from that today, folks. Come on. We are accountable before God for what we do, but also for what we say. It's so easy to justify our behavior and our actions or our lack of actions. and, And by saying all the right words, right, it's so easy to wound others by our words, too. We've got to be so careful, right? Right out of the tongue comes life and death, doesn't it? The power of the tongue, isn't it? The Bible tells us that by our words we'll be acquitted, but by our words we will be condemned. Ouch, that hurts. We've got to be careful with those words. And the third point I made last week was that we will be held accountable before God as to how we treat our fellow man. I use the first children of the first couple as an example. Remember, Cain killed his brother Abel. And when God confronted Cain, he asked him, where is his brother Abel was? And Cain asked the question back to God, am I my brother's keeper? The answer is a big yes. As God holds Cain accountable for his actions against his brother. And uh, if we look throughout the Bible, we are told how to treat our fellow man. And when we don't treat them well, there are consequences, isn't there? It only make, but th- think about this, though. It only makes sense as Christians that we should treat uh, others and be accountable for our actions and for our words and for what we say and do, right? Because we are representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. We reflect him. We represent him. If we go to work or go in our neighborhood and call ourselves a Christian, then we turn around and we're, and we're you know, kicking the dog and cussing away and, and getting drunk and walking down the street, falling in their yard. I don't think that's a good testimony. I guess nobody agreed, but it isn't a good testimony, okay? Let me just tell you that, guys. Hopefully you're not doing that. I'm sure you're not. Okay, praise the Lord. All right, let's go to Romans chapter 13, starting with verse 1. Everyone, say Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established the authorities that exist have been established by God consequently he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves for rulers hold no terror for those who do what is right but for those who do wrong 
Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because, uh, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servant who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you that it's a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet, God. Lord, it guides us, it leads us, it shows us where to go, it teaches us wrong from right, it keeps us from the extremes, it keeps us where we're supposed to be, and we thank you for your word. And Lord, as we, as we proclaim the word today, I just ask that, Lord, we will just draw from it, you'll speak to our hearts, and just show us, Lord, what it is you want us to hear today. And Lord, may again, we not be just hearers, but be doers of your word. And I ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's children said, amen, amen. amen. When you sit down, tell someone, just break through. Just break through. Amen, amen, amen. Think about those football games that just popped in my head. They got that paper, and then all the cheerleaders come out, pew, break, the bat, break it, and then everybody runs through. That's what, that's what picture I, I just came to my head. So that's what we want to do. We want to bust through and keep busting through, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, hey. If we are ever going to see a breakthrough in our nation, we are going to have to learn to respect governing authorities and acknowledge who's ultimately an authority and realize that authority is also has been given to us. And so that's kind of what we're going to cover today in a nutshell. So let's start with respecting authority. When we realize who has established the governing authorities, as we just read, it makes it a whole lot easier to respect them because we realize that God has put them there whether or not we agree with everything they say or do. That's not the point, right? And if if we rebel against them, we are rebelling against what God has put in place. And if we do that, we will bring judgment upon ourselves as we just read. That doesn't mean we have to agree with all their policies, not at all. But even in those situations, the Bible gives us clarity as to what we should do, whether we are in agreement or not, with the decisions our governing authorities are making. And so first of all, I would suggest this from the Word of God. Pray for those in authority. We just did. It's biblical. It's right. Romans 13, we're told. Paul tells us to to pray for those in authority. Paul, in his letter to Timothy, tells him this in 1st Timothy uh, chapter 2 starting with verse 1 it says this I urge then first of all that requests God bless you prayers intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone for kings and all for those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Pray that God will give our governing authorities wisdom, like we did this morning, in discernment and understanding and favor with God, that they would grow in their relationship with the Lord, or that they would come to know Him personally if it appears that maybe they don't know the Lord. See, we get the government we pray for. We get the government we pray for. We have to remember in those times we get upset with our elected officials that they are not our enemies. They're not our enemies, okay? We pray, but also in America we have other options thanks to our founding fathers and the form of government they established. If we don't like what we're seeing from our governing officials, right, then we can run for office to be the change that we desire, right? And secondly, we can vote, And in my opinion, we should vote. We should vote. Because not only that, men have paid an ultimate price, their lives, for the the freedom for us to be able to vote and to choose our government. Of course it's important. Yes, we have a a say-so. So that we can have these freedoms. And let me just say this. Please don't complain about our government if you don't even vote. Don't even say nothing. Why even say something when you don't even do the very thing you should be doing? Your vote is your voice. 
If you haven't spoken up, then don't speak out. That just makes us a whiner. Remember, the Bible says do everything without complaining and whining, right? It does, so don't do that. We have, but here's the problem. We've lost all respect for authority in America, and it's not just government officials. It's just everything, it seems like. I'm talking about everything all across the board. You just take this one thing, for example. We never used to refer to our president in the United States as just by his last name, King. Or I, I wasn't president, but you get what I'm saying. Obama, uh, whatever, uh, you know, uh, uh, Trump, Biden, whatever. We never did that before, did we? We don't do it to our current president either now. We just say their last name. That's all we do. Instead of President so-and-so, it's just those names we throw out. Something to think about. Worse than that, we have people on both political spectrums cursing out the president, cursing out our government. This is wrong and it needs to stop. God is not pleased with that kind of behavior. Before we move on, there is one exception, though, that I do want to say that just, is justified in scriptures for not obeying the governing authorities that are over us. And that, and that is when the government tells us to disobey God's commands and God's laws and God's rules, okay? In Acts chapter 5, we read about how the apostles were performing many, many miracles, signs and wonders among the people. And guess what happens after that? The crowd started showing up, didn't they? And all who came were healed. Well, not surprisingly, the religious folk of that day did not find that very good and very exciting, did they? Right? And when I say religious folks, I'm talking about the high priests, his associates, and the Sadducees. They didn't find that too amusing and too funny and too fun and too exciting because they were filled with jealousy. See, they were the religious ones before that. They were the ones everybody was looking to. They followed all the rules and laws, right? All that kind of stuff. And, uh, and so they had the apostles arrested and put in jail. Let me pause there just a moment and say this. We're in a spiritual battle. And whenever God begins to do great things, there will be resistance from the enemy and his forces. But don't let that discourage you. Don't let that deter you because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Right? Don't let that discourage you. All right, back to, back to Acts chapter 5. During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Wow, talk about a jailhouse rock, right? <laughs> Something happening, right? Boom, there goes the doors, they're walking out. The angel tells them to go and stand in the temple courts and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak, they did just that. The high priest calls together the Sanhedrin, which are the elders, and he sent them to the jail to get the apostles. They find the jail's lock. The guards are standing at the door, and, but when they opened them, the apostles were gone. These leaders find out that the disciples were in the temple courts teaching the word, so they had them brought in before the Sanhedrin, the high priest, and he says in verse 28, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. Amen. Amen. If the governing officials are trying to limit your witness, witnessing and you're praying and you're reading your word or you're worshiping, you and I have every right to obey the higher authority, which is God Almighty. Amen. God Almighty is the higher authority. Our first allegiance is to Him. And besides, in the United States, our rights are inalienable, given to us by God. They can't be restrained or repealed by man according to our Constitution. Hallelujah. And if our governing officials are doing wrong, it's not our job to get revenge. Just before the opening verses I read in Romans 13, if you go to the chapter before, that's the verse, that chapter 13 is concerning submission to authorities. Romans 12, 19 states this, do not, everybody say do not, yeah. take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. And then it goes on to say, if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And by doing so, you'll heap burning coals on his head or her head, whatever the case might be. So it's not our job to get revenge. That's God's job. We, we put them in God's hands, amen? But we keep praying for them, 
right? We, if we've got field to be run for office, we run for office, and we vote. We do what we can do to make a difference, and then we, we step back and do, and we keep walking our faith out in Jesus Christ. Okay, let's move on to my second point this morning. We have to, re- to remember and acknowledge who is the ultimate authority. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. We see presidents and we see prime ministers and we see kings on the earth and it's so easy to start thinking, hey, they're running the show. But they're not. There's someone behind the curtain, if you will, that is calling the shots and not just spiritually, but also in what goes on in the physical realm. Hallelujah. See, we don't see so much that goes on in that spiritual realm, but it's going on all the time. There's a battle up there, good and evil. It's going on, trust me. Forces are in, up in there, and it's going on. And as we pray, things move up there. As we worship, things move up there. As we read our Bible, things work, move up there. As we witness, things move up there in a the good way. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. But if we moan and whine and complain and curse people out, we're not, we're not helping anything out, folks, are we? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, that we're not going to do those things. So, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, which starts out uh, in, with the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 and ends in Matthew 7, after Jesus finished saying all these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. He has authority. Hallelujah. Not surprising. When you think about the religious leaders of Jesus' day, when he walked on the earth, they were all show and no go, weren't they? So busy making themselves look good and trying to obey every little law. All religion with no power. All religion, no power. Now here comes this guy who they didn't really know, you know who he was. Uh, we know now who he is, but they didn't really know. They, they, this guy is, is the son of God. They didn't realize it then. Even, but even think about it. Even the disciples were still trying to figure out who is this guy. All we have to do is go to the next chapter, Matthew 8, to see this in full display. In that chapter, Jesus heals a man with leprosy. Remember the centurion came and, and, this, and then he heals this man with leprosy and uh, he was paralyzed and in terrible suffering and he did it and the guy wasn't even present. And, the, and of course, the centurion had faith to believe and, and, God, and Jesus makes a reference to that. Then he heals Peter's mother-in-law who is lying in bed with a fever. She gets up and starts waiting on Jesus. If that weren't enough, that evening, many demon-possessed were coming to him, and the demons were getting cast out. He was driving out the spirits. Man, that's a good day. That's a really good day. And he also healed many, many sick that came that same day. As you can imagine, the crowd started finding their way, started finding their way towards him. And when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake, the Sea of Galilee. And let's pick it up there in Matthew 8, starting with verse 23. Then... He, Jesus, got into the boat and his disciples followed him without warning. Have you ever had something happen to you in life without, where there's, without warning? All of a sudden something happens? Without warning, and usually it's something like this, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. Not a good place to be. Have you ever been in a boat where the waves start coming over? It's not a good feeling. Never forget. I don't know if I ever told this story. It just came to me. We were, my brother, he, he was at State. He had a friend that lived in Port Austin, right on the tip of the thumb. thumb and uh, he, was, he took us out on the boat one day. It was like, ah, I can't remember, eight, nine foot waves. He, and he takes us out there, and there's this big storm, and we're like, we're doing this. And we're all three, my, my two brothers and I are like, ooh. He's like, isn't this great? We're like, ooh. We're about ready to, you know, Ralph and barf and all that kind of stuff. And he's thinking it was just the greatest thing since sliced bread. But let me tell you, when you're in a boat like that, you can't even see over the wave. When you go down, it's not fun, Okay. So here they are. The waves start sweet coming over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. They're all freaking out. He's sleeping. And the disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. I'm sure it wasn't, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves And it was completely calm. Good water skiing now, right? Okay, sorry. It is, though, when it's calm like that. The the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. 
Now, if you're sitting in your boat and some guy gets up and goes, hey, calm down, stop right now, winds and waves, you'd be like, whoa, what is that, that dude, what is going on here? But see, they kept seeing him as the son of, a son of man, which he was, but he was also the son of God. God the son walking amongst them. Men don't have authority to calm the winds and the waves. At least I haven't seen any that do that. And by the way, when you have all authority, you can sleep in the boat during a terrible storm. When waves are crashing in and your boat, you know what? There's no worries. Never no worries. But wait a minute. Shouldn't that be us because we have Jesus Christ in us? Shouldn't there be no worries? Amen. Not just Jesus then, but Jesus, but us now because Jesus is within us. So when the waves start crashing in, shouldn't there be no worries? No worry. As they say in Hawaii, hang loose. No worries. Come on. But we worry and we fret and we get fearful and we get afraid. It's like, wait a minute, we forgot who's in the boat with us. Who's in the car with us? Who's in that family situation with us? Who's at work with us? Who's in the neighborhood with us? When the dog's doing his doo-doo in our yard and we're all upset. Wait a minute, Jesus is in every situation. Come on. Not only does his teaching have authority, but as we just saw, he has authority over nature itself. Mm. What a mighty God we serve. What's even better, yet he has authority over what plagues us, and that is the curse of sin. After Jesus calms the storm in Matthew 8, and he lands on shore, two demon-possessed men come from the tombs. How many know that's going to be an interesting scene, right? And Jesus drives out the demons, and they, and they go into the pigs, and the pigs go down into the water and drown themselves. Wow. Can you imagine if you're in that scene? That would be quite the scene. As Matthew chapter 9 begins, Jesus gets back into the boat, and he crosses over to his own town of Nazareth. Some men bring him a paralytic lying on a mat. And when Jesus sees their faith, he says to the paralytic, Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. Of course, that roused the religious folks. They weren't happy with that at all. Of course, they were just up in arms, right? And verse 3 of Matthew 9 says this, starting with verse 3. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, then he said to the paralytic, get up, take your mat, and go home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given authority to men. Yeah, they didn't realize who, we're, who we are here, who he is right here yet, right? If we're ever going to see a breakthrough in our nation, non-believers need to know that Jesus has the authority to forgive all our sins and their sins. Amen. He sealed the deal when he went to the cross on Calvary, and then he rose from the dead, right? Amen. Colossians 2.15, Having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them at the cross. Hallelujah. You know, as I'm reading through Matthew chapter 8 and 9, it becomes obvious that he's revealing to the people and the disciples and the religious leaders that he is the ultimate authority by his actions and by his words. Amen. You just see it unfolding one thing after the other. I mean... If it wasn't obvious at this point that this guy is something unusual, he's different. So what is about this guy? He's walking around healing people, sending, sending spirits and pigs going into the lake. He's raising people. from. What is up, up with this dude? He, he's just, what is this guy? Not only is Jesus the authority on earth, but he's also the authority in heaven. Colossians 1.16 tells us, For by him all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, Visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Whew. Wow. First Peter 3.22 states it this way. Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven, is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Whew. Awesome, awesome. All right, number three. His authority 
has been given to you and to me. Believers, hallelujah. When I began this message, I didn't realize the Holy Spirit would be walking me through the book of Matthew. But that's exactly what he's done. <laughs> Jesus wasn't all about authority for authority's sake. He wasn't trying to be the BMOC. You're like, the BMOC? The big man on campus. He wasn't trying to be the big man on campus. Yeah, look at me. I'm all that in a bag of chips. No, 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 no. He didn't have to try. He already was the BMOC. He already was the big man on campus. He had nothing to prove to anybody. As they say, the proof was in the pudding. Look what he's doing during those three years of earthly ministry. Good Lord, he was doing so many things. It said, you remember, it says he, the books couldn't contain all the stuff that he did. Think about that. The, 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 world, the, the world wouldn't have enough room for all the book, all the stuff that he did. This is just a small bit of what Jesus did. A very small bit. He did a lot of stuff, folks, and he's still doing a lot of stuff. Hallelujah. I'll say. He's still doing so many things in the world that, you know, we don't even see. Even in our own lives. There's stuff he's doing. We don't even see it. He's doing it. He's doing it. As we allow him to, we open our hearts, right? Hallelujah. Jesus was all about giving that authority to, to others so that they could do what he is doing, was doing, right? Here we go, Matthew 10.1. He, Jesus, called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Praise God. Well, pastor, that's your job. You were called to the ministry. You were called to the pastorate. You float in on your helicopter, come in here, speak for a little bit. You float back out all week, and God's called you to do that. No, 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 no. God's called you to, to do that as well. To lay hands on the sick, to see them whole, to pray for people, to win people to Jesus, to win backsliders home. He's called you to do that as well. I'm not at your workplace. I'm not in your neighborhood. You're saying, thank God, some of you, but that's, I'm not there. So he's called you too. Hallelujah. Because you'd see some guy come and go, hey, good morning, it's 6 o'clock, let's get up. And you'd be like, oh gosh, get rid of this neighbor. Okay, that's me I'm talking about. All right, so as we jump ahead four verses, the Bible states in Matthew 10, uh, 5 through 8, it says this, these 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Right? Let me make a quick comment here in case you may be thinking and hearing this and saying, boy, Jesus was kind of exclusive. exclusive. He was like a racist, et cetera, et cetera. Whoa, 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 time out. Jesus said this to the Jews because he came to them first. They were the ones that God chose to tell the rest of the world about God. Just look at the book of Acts, and ultimately, that is exactly what happened. The Jewish apostles shared the good news throughout the Roman Empire, and soon after, the Gentiles came into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ by the boatloads, I'll add. This church is a testimony of that over 2,000 year, years later. There's Gentiles that know Jesus, and not just here, all over this city, this country, and all around the world. Hallelujah. But it wasn't just the 12 he sent out. If, if, if we jump ahead, exactly two books ahead in the Bible, to Luke chapter 10, it states, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others. Now, these are not disciples, immediate disciples, the 12, and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Kind of reminds me of when there's an evangelistic crusade. God sends forth a, a team to go out and prepare and kind of prepare, prepare the soil, right, and get it ready for because here comes Jesus. Well, you know what? When they're preaching the word at those evangelistic crusades, yeah, get those hearts open up, get them ready. Hallelujah. So in verse 9, uh, he tells them to heal the sick in whatever town they went to and to also tell them that the kingdom of God is near. In verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. That's what we do, don't we? We get all excited about certain things that God's like, hmm. Jesus is like, hmm. And Jesus replies, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. 
I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Hallelujah. Well, that's great, Pastor, but that all happened when Jesus was here on earth. And I've been told, you know, I've been told, Pastor, by this other person at this other church that, that all that stuff died 2,000 years ago with the apostles. That's it. It's over. We don't see we, no more miracles today, no more healing, no more speaking in tongues, none of that stuff. It's all for yesterday. Well, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Amen. After the resurrection... The book in Matthew 28, Matthew closes with these words. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All, say all, all, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, right? And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I see a lot of everywhere and always and all, and I mean, this is, he's serious here, guys. He's serious here. This same command goes for us today. 2022 on September 25th, I believe it is today. What if we as the church started walking out in the authority which Jesus has given us as born again, spirit-filled believers? You talk about a breakthrough in our nation, that's it, right there. We start walking in that authority that God's given us. You wanna see a breakthrough? So you're walking down the hallway, and well, I, guess there's, well, I guess it's kind of a hallway. You're walking down, well, a hallway. Let's just go to school, for example. You're walking down the hallway in your school, and God says, pray for that one, and you pray for your high school. Boom, they go down. They get healed, and the blind see. But trust me, God's going to be glorified. God's going to be exalted. You're walking in my ear. God says, go pray for that lady right there. She's in a bed. I go over and pray for her. She's encouraged. She starts shouting, Jesus, whatever she does, and God, God's exalted, and he's lifted up. You're showing the power of God that God is alive and he's well today. He's real today as he was 2,000 years ago. Whenever you obey God and walk out in the authority that's been given to you by faith in Jesus' name, God, take our faith to another level. Take our faith to another level, Lord. My Bible tells me that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth that's here that's uh, Wisconsin, that's Florida, that's South America, and that's Egypt and the Middle East, wherever you want to go, all the, way, all the way around. It's the whole thing, folks. It's the whole thing. John 14, 12 through 14, Jesus said in that chapter, he said, beginning in verse 12, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me anything in my name and I will do it. Let me ask us, do we believe that? Do we really believe that? Because that's a wow. That's a big wow right there. Do we really believe that? If he could do anything we ask in his name, do we believe that? Wow. What are we waiting for? Are we waiting for a formal invitation? It's already been given. I didn't even get an amen, but it's already been given. If you're in Christ and you're a believer, he's in you. Now you've got to let him out of you to a lost and dying world that's hurting. Go affect somebody for Jesus Christ this week. Don't stop there. Do it the week after and the week after and the week after until the Lord comes in for his bride or you, or you go up, right, and you're done and you die. I mean, whatever the case might be, do it and keep doing it. That's what it's really going to take to see a breakthrough in our nation. See, authority is not a bad thing if we, if we do what God says for us to do, right? We know it's from him, and we understand it's from him, and, and we do what God's called us to do. We've got to break through. We've got to do what God has called us to do. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Boy, what if, we, what if the church just really got it and said, you know, 
I don't think it was just for those 12 disciples to be doing all that they were doing. What if us, whatever is in here today, 45 people, whatever it is, what if we all left here and just started doing what God's called us to fully without, without reservation and by faith in Jesus' name? I tell you, in every church in the city started doing that, Grand Rapids wouldn't look the, look the same by next Sunday. Guarantee you, Grand Rapids would not look the same. Hallelujah. But you know, that, that authority doesn't come without first surrendering and fully surrendering to the Lord Jesus Christ. And after you have done so, the Holy Spirit comes within you. He resides in you. And uh, he gives you the power then to lead other people to Jesus and to see backsliders coming home and to lay hands on the sick and see them healed and, and to cast out evil spirits. You've got to have Jesus in you before you can do those things to see those things happen outside of you. And so it all begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you don't know him, he's there for you. He cares for you. He loves you. All you got to do is say, God, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life and heart. I want to live for you now. I don't want to know more about, about just about God. I want to know God personally, not just about him. I want to know Jesus Christ personally as my Savior, my Lord. Trust me, he'll change your life. Why do I say that? Because it did to this old guy. When I was younger, when I was messed up, he did it. He did it. It was a complete 180. And he can do it for you as well. He's not a respecter of persons. He loves everyone the same. And so if that's you today, just click on our playlist, about, and you'll see more about a uh, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, as you do that, we want to get you a booklet in your hand called Brand New to help you walk with Jesus for the first 30 days, all right? Do that and let us know how yeah, you've done that, and we want to rejoice with you because all the angels in heaven will be rejoicing as well. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for authority. We thank you that, Lord, help us to learn, to teach us to respect authority. But Lord, let us realize that we have an ultimate authority in Jesus, is Jesus Christ. And Lord, that he's, you've given that authority to us. And so, Lord, I'm asking that we will see that we, we have that authority, but not only see that we have it, but Lord, that we would walk out in that authority. Lord, and we would do it in love, but we would walk it out in authority. Speak it boldly. The, bold, the righteous are as bold as a lion, the Bible says. Lord, help us to be bold, but help us to be compassionate and loving and do it with boldness. But Lord, we thank you for giving us that authority in your precious because of your blood and because of what you did at the cross. Now, Lord, bless your people this week, Lord. Give them divine appointments. Lord, I pray we'll hear testimonies next week of all that God has done. And we thank you for being such a loving, good Father. <clears throat> in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.